with a hospitality degree, especially when you combine those interests with other degrees or other interests that you may have. Um, so with this event, we will be showing you that. And at the end, we will hear from Dr. Barber, who has a unique career path with hospitality law. So that's one of the ways you can combine hospitality with another interest. All right, so here is just a snapshot of what we will be talking about during this event. We will start out with just giving you a brief overview of what hospitality is, um, in case you're not super familiar with the industry as a whole. Um, we will also give you some cool statistics about hospitality's place in the economy and society. And then we'll move on to the fun part, which is showcasing different alum who have these unique career paths um, from combining their interest with hospitality and something else. Um, just so you can get an idea of what these career paths look like and give you a real um, example of someone who has done it and achieved it and someone who has graduated from Georgia State and from the School of Hospitality that we have. And lastly, like I said, we will have our Q&A session with Dr. Barber. Throughout the session, if you have a question, um, feel free to unmute yourself and just speak up and ask it. You can also use, I think there's a raise hand feature and a question feature. You can use that. Um, Chow and Yin will be monitoring the chat box. You can drop questions in there as well. Um, but please ask questions. We will make sure to answer and hopefully help you. So moving on, what is hospitality? And before I get into this, I'm actually interested to know um, kind of where y'all all are in your college career. So if you wanna drop your major in the chat box, if you're an alum, you can drop your degree that you graduated with, but I'm kind of just curious to know who's all here today and Chow and Yin can go ahead and look at that and maybe let me know the results a little later. But if you wanna go ahead and do that, that would be awesome. I'm just interested to know um where everybody's at um so what is hospitality hospitality is easily the largest and fastest growing industry in the entire world and it's because it is so broad but you can break it up into four different segments so picture it like a little umbrella and there's little segments underneath it and the first segment would be hotels and lodging so that consists of all your hotels, your Airbnbs, bed and breakfast, pretty much anywhere that you're residing somewhere temporarily or semi-permanent, um, that's hotels and lodging. And then you have food and beverage, which is restaurants and your bars, your breweries, all of that fun stuff. Um, and then we have travel and tourism, which is a huge industry on its own that's inside of the hospitality industry, which incorporates um, like travel agencies, you have your visitor centers, you have all the transportation industry, that's your airlines, um, trains, all of that. And lastly, we have events and entertainment, um, which is event management and like concerts, music festivals, meetings and conventions and trade shows, all of that fun stuff. So so much to do with hospitality with one degree you have the option to do any of this which is so awesome and so cool um but yeah and i just realized i never introduced myself guys i am so sorry i am maddie thibodeau i'm a sophomore at georgia state i am studying hospitality um so yeah, please feel free to ask me any questions. And I'm co-hosting this event with Yin, and I'll let Yin um, introduce herself right now. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today uh, to talk with all of you. Uh, my name is Yin, and I'm a senior grad graduating in May with a hospitality degree. And um, one of the reasons why that me and Maddie, or for me personally, I want to um, host this event is that even though I have hospitality, um, my professional experience has mostly been like things in things. So I was just curious as of how I can best align my interests with my um, professional um, pathway. And so I, I thought that this event would be helpful for you guys, you know, like in terms of exploring what's out there 
what's available and what's been done um, or what's been achieved by our alumni. Um, and so on that note, I want to just briefly touch on hospitality's impact on society and travel and tourism and food and lodging is seen globally. Um, hospitality does have an, not only a natural impact, but also a global impact. And in 2018, um, the hospitality industry accounted for more than 10% of global GDP. That's a lot of capital and um, resources that um, hospitality is responsible for. And most of the companies for hospitality, or not most, but a lot of them are international. So, um, for example, like Marriott, they have a lot of locations in the United States, in Asia, in Africa, and all the continents. Um, and we also see that in um, the food industry, like McDonald's, Burger King. And then um, Maddie actually has an interesting fact, a fun fact. Yes, so one of my best friends back home, I'm from Louisiana, um, her grandfather is the CEO and founder of Crispy Crunchy Chicken. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of Crispy Crunchy, but it's found in so many gas on the U.S. Without knowing it, you've probably seen their logo and have seen them before because they are everywhere. And just recently, I think a few years ago, he was able to expand his um to have locations internationally so that's just super cool that I know someone who he started this in his garage literally started this in his garage and is now um a multinational enterprise so pretty cool yeah and I think that's a very interesting uh thing about hospitality is that like a lot of the companies within hospitality have like franchising prospects so you can actually grow your business not only on like a local um, level but also like internationally. Um, and that, um, we also, I also want to like, uh, mention that the hospitality industry like actually employs 16 million people in the US alone and to put that into perspective um, Georgia had a population about 10 million people in 2019. And so you can imagine that the entire state of Georgia plus 6 million people had the same uh, job, uh, not the same job, but had jobs in the same country. And that's a lot of jobs. Um, and then, you know, every hospitality job is added every 2.6 seconds. And so if you're looking for a job of your own uh, within the hospitality industry, um, there's always something out there. And for us as a department, we always update our job board with the latest opportunity. So um, you can check that out um, on our website. And later I will drop that link in the chat as well. Um, and then in Atlanta alone, um, hospitality has a huge presence um, where many hospitality companies non-hospitality companies are headquartered and just being in GSU alone you're surrounded with several hospitality job opportunities such as the Candler Hotel, the Grand Hyatt, the Atlanta Marriott Marquis, um, Capital City Club, Chick-fil-A and then um, other from those names you can see from the screen here that um, there are some companies that you may never realize that they are a part of the industry, um, such as Coca-Cola, Delta Airlines, Chick-fil-A, or um, G. And then um, some other familiar local names are the Fox Theater, State Farm Arena, uh, Georgia World Congress Center, and the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau. And then you can also find hospita hospitality-related jobs in non companies that are here in Atlanta. Um, so on here we have KPMG. Um, if you don't already know, it is an accounting firm, one of the big four. And then we actually have on the call here today, Alexi, and she actually got a summer internship with KPMG, but in the corporate events and meeting um, role. 
And that was interesting because I never thought that, you know, why it, that an accounting firm would have a opportunity like that. So for those who are um, considering hospitality as their major, um, and if you're interested in like events, just know that a lot of corporate um, companies have uh, events and meetings positions. We also have NCR here. It's a it's a technology and like service um, company, and they have a they have a uh, focus on restaurant solutions as well. So that's your point of sale system and kitchen production software, hardware, and also customer service technology. And um, I've looked up on the website, and they have positions such as project manager or like sales representative that you can use your hospitality knowledge on. And then we also see here that um, there's the Home Depot and um, they were also um, manager of meetings and events or customer service coordinator. And then same for um, the Southern, Southern company. Um, that's your uh, electricity and like, uh, company and they also have positions in uh, meetings and events as well as conference services. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And that's all really interesting information and so cool that Alexi has her internship with KPMG. That's really cool. I never even knew that. So <laughs> yeah, um, I mean yeah. if any of you guys are interested in Alexi's experience, you can always feel free to reach out to her in the chat box. Yeah, so this slide right here um, is kind of just giving an overview of how the next breakdown is working. Um, this is a just as a disclaimer, this is not all the different majors and schools and colleges that Georgia State offers within the university. This is a very limited list um, that I just picked kind of the most common majors that you'll see combined with hospitality. Um, so kind of how this works is if you see this big circle right here, I don't know if y'all can see my cursor, um, but it's you have Georgia State as a whole and then within Georgia State, Georgia State has different colleges and departments and in those departments you have different like other departments and pathways and schools within those departments that um, you can major in. So you have the Robinson College of Business right here, and you have the College of Education and Development, College of Law and Communication, and we have other colleges. The university is huge. Um, and within the Robinson College of Business, you'll see majors like entrepreneurship. This is where hospitality is located, managerial sciences, all of those that you see on the screen, plus more. This is not a full list, like I said. Um, but I kind of just gave you this. You can kind of prepare yourself and see the different majors that we'll be discussing. And I also added on here just some common majors that you'll see. Um, combined with hospitality that we may not talk about during the presentation. One of those being sports administration. If you're a sports administration major and you're also interested in hospitality, you can drop your email in the chat and we can have a one-on-one -on -one and discuss the different career paths available with that. But I just added that in there because I have so many sports administration majors in my hospitality courses and in the hospitality student orgs. It's a very common major that's combined with hospitality. So here are the first two alum that we will be talking about today. So first up, we have Ferris Cargar, and his career path kind of combines hospitality with entrepreneurship. He began his career working at Rumi's Kitchen, where he worked his way up to general manager. Um, he decided he loved the food and beverage industry so much that he was like, I can do this. I know all the operations. I worked from you know, being a server all the way to general manager, I know how to run a restaurant, let me open up my own restaurant. So that's how he combined entrepreneurship with hospitality because food and beverage is a part of the hospitality industry. And he opened up his own restaurant that is actually located in Midtown Atlanta. So if you happen to see it, please go stop by and take a grab a bite to eat over there. He is SU alum. Um, and it's Del Bar, Atlanta. I actually work um, across the kind of across the street um, from him. So 
super cool thing. Um, and that's what he does currently. Um, next, we have Christopher Walker. Christopher Walker also dabbled in entrepreneurship a little bit with his first position that he had was he was the owner of C Atlanta Sites. C Atlanta Sites was a travel company, kind of a tourism company more, um, where he had a little tour bus kind of thing. And he would take you around Atlanta to see all the cool different tourist attractions. Um, and after he did that, he began working at Ben and Jerry's where he is currently the off-premise and operations manager. So if you didn't know, I'm sure you all see Ben and Jerry's in all the different grocery stores in the ice cream section. Ben and Jerry's is amazing. Um, but Ben and Jerry's also does catering, which I didn't know until very recently. So he kind of controls all the stuff that happens outside of the grocery stores in Atlanta. Um, so that involves like all the different catering things. If they do a pop-up shop, he's managing that and um, all the operations that are outside of the grocery store and all of the people that work there. So that's how he combined managerial sciences with hospitality because if you didn't know, Ben and Jerry's is a hospitality company because it's food. Um, but yeah, so those are just some cool, different, unique things. Um, and if you have any questions, them, feel free to ask us. Um, they're on LinkedIn and everything. Yeah, and I also want to add to that is um, like the way that you can um, our hospitality class into like these um, interests. Um, so for um, our, we have a class called um, Hospitality HR, um, Human Resources Management class, where you can learn um, employment laws and provisions and like different ways to do employee training and really and that's all the basics that you need to know in order to step into a managerial role like Ferris. And, um, it, and it doesn't have to be a hospitality. In this class, you can apply the knowledge to just whatever um, industry that you will be in in the future. Yeah. And then next up, um, you want to talk about the alumni that are working in the marketing and PR field. And before getting to um, introducing these alumni, I want to talk about uh, one of the required the one of the required courses for um, hospitality students, which is hospitality branding. And in this class, you will learn about different marketing strategies and how they inherently ties in with the operations and management of hospitality businesses and then um now that we can move on to our alumni uh, the first one that i want to introduce you today is Najah fawaz um she graduated with a hospitality degree and is now in a uh, marketing role she's currently a project leader um for employee brand experience at Delta Airlines. And before stepping into this current role, she was actually a uniform project leader at Delta. And one of her past projects was to lead a marketing group um, and then release unif new uniform for Delta uh, in 2018. And before she even stepped into that uniform project leader role, she actually started her um, career with Delta with an internship that was advertised by um, the School of Hospitality. So uh, that just gives an example of how you can uh, use uh, the school to um, your advantage and we have resources that we can give you so you can take advantage of that. And then um, we have Daniel Cook and she recently founded her own PR company called So Happy Social, and it is a boutique creative agency um, aiming to maximize the guest experience online for hospitality businesses and brands through graphic design, content creation, and social media strategy. Uh, strategy. And 
prior to being a full-time entrepreneur, um, Danielle was actually a marketing coordinator at Elevate Experiences, and it is a brand experience agency with a focus on events. And in addition, some of her uh, responsibilities include um, designing social media strategies and maximizing advertisement efficiency for um, and she is on Instagram. And if you want to follow her, um, she's very active. Um, her, I think her account has a following of almost half a million. If, is that correct, Maddie? Yeah. Yeah. So you can find her on Instagram at, um, I think, so Happy Social. Um, but yeah, I also was in contact with Najah. I um, reached out to her on LinkedIn and let her know about this event and that it was happening. And she said she is more than happy to connect with any of you on LinkedIn. So if her job path sounds interesting to you, and maybe you want to work at Delta, um, or maybe you just want to learn more about how she got there and her experience at Georgia State, um, please feel free to reach out to her. If we don't send the links in the chat right now, I'll make sure to send everyone who attended today an email with links to these people's social medias and so y'all can reach out to them. Um, but yeah, she's super nice. I've been in contact with her. So that's that's my word of advice as student to student is that if you see someone on LinkedIn that has a cool career path, reach out to them because most people are so willing to speak with students and tell you how they got there and mentor you a little bit. So, Next up, we have Devon Reeves. Um, Devon is super active at the School of Hospitality. She's actually one of our board members. Um, and I follow her on social media. She is super cool and she has done so much. She is a true like superwoman. Um, she is so awesome. So I'm so excited to talk about her today. Um, one of the things that she does is she's the co-founder of Epic Collective and Epic Collective is a community of investors who invest in commercial real estate, primarily hotels or retail. Um, so that's how this ties in with real estate. Most people who hear real estate or think of real estate, they'll think of your, um, your real estate people who sell you like your house or your apartment or condos, but a huge part of hospitality and a huge, like a really important part is commercial real estate because hotels need a place to put their hotel or franchises need a place to put their franchise buildings as well. <laughs> so Epic Collective is a part of that commercial real estate industry um, where investors can come together and invest in those commercial properties. Um, she's also the founder of the Vaughn Group um, the Vaughn Group is kind of like a consulting company. Um, she assists hotel owners in mm -hmm. making financial and innovative decisions and basically just overall helps them develop their company in the most creative and innovative way. Um, and she does this a lot on her social media as well for anyone who is interested in investing or becoming a hotel owner. She posts so many tips and tricks um, on her Instagram. So I would check her out on Instagram as well. Um, and I'm almost positive she's written a couple books too. She, she sets <laughs> goals each year and is like, this year I'm going to help this many people save up this much money and invest this much money and make this much money. And it's so cool. She is so awesome. And actually just recently she made history as being um, the youngest African-American woman to co-own a large brand name hotel in the United States. She just closed on this deal very recently. So like I said, she is a super cool person and it's so awesome that she's an alum here and that she's so willing to stay connected to the school and help students. I reached out to her on LinkedIn as well. And she said, yes, I would love to connect with students. So if this career path sounds interesting to you, um, please reach out to her. She would love to hear from you. Um, and I'll make sure to include that in the email as well. But that's the one. Yeah, and for any of you who is, go back to the past slide, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. Add something. yeah. So for um, if any of you here is interested in the same like uh, track as Devon, um, there are two hospitality classes that you can take. The first one is franchising, 
and in this class and actually in this class right now and it's super cool because we have um, different speakers uh, who go on to our class and talk about their companies and how uh, what their franchise um, looks like. And then apart from that, you also learn about the roles of franchisers and franchisees and different case studies, um, real life case studies. Um, the next one is hotel management. And in this class, you will learn about the structure of the lodging industry um, and functions of all these departments within a hotel. So those are the two classes that I would personally recommend um, you to take if you are interested in the um, real estate side of hospitality. Yeah. And so next up, uh, we want to feature another two of our amazing alumni. Um, but before again, I want to again talk about uh, some of the classes some of the classes that are related to the finance and accounting side of hospitality. And as you guys go through the business foundation curriculum, uh, two of the most important classes that you will have taken or will take in 2022, also known as financial accounting and managerial accounting. And if you're taking hospitality classes, there's a, also a good chance that at some point in your third or fourth, fourth you'll be taking um, hospitality financial analysis, um, is, uh, which is HADM 4100 with probably Dr. Kyle Hyde. And we all know that in order for a hospitality business to thrive, it has to be in good financial health. And all the employees with a focus on finance and accounting would be the one making sure of that. Um, and for those who want to be in a leadership position, um, at a hospitality business, uh, such as an assistant general manager or general manager or area um, manager, uh, you also have to be able to understand the financial statistics of your own property and your competition. And so with that said, I want to uh, introduce you guys to Brenda Friedman, um, who is working in the finance side of hospitality. Um, she graduated at Georgia State from Georgia State with a hospitality degree. She went on to work as an in-house revenue analyst at Starwood Hotels. And currently she is the revenue manager at Marriott International, um, working in the revenue department. A few of the responsibilities that you can expect is um, reporting daily pricing recommendations producing revenue forecasts, as well as supporting um, other executives in the strategic management of um, revenue processes. And on the other hand, we have Dr. Patel. Uh, she has a similar start as a revenue manager at Starwood, but she has transitioned into a less conventional role with the associate market manager role at Expedia Group. And in this role, um, she helps onboard, develop, and maintain a high portfolio of hotel products. And then after that, she moved on to be the area director of revenue strategy at RevRock. And RevRock is a hospitality revenue management consultant firm that provides performance analysis, pricing, development, and much more. But she is the sales executive at Triptease. And Triptease is actually a very interesting like hospitality startup because it provides um, software as a service. This software helps hotels increase their online bookings and maximize revenue for minimum cost. Um, and that all of that is done through um, data enabled targeting and personalization. So for those uh, of you here who are maybe a little bit interested in the startup scene or like the technology side, um, hospitality industry offers a lot of um, different like areas and like roles similar to Bajal here that you can maybe look into. 
definitely and especially now <laughs> so many hospitality companies have had to pivot and create new ways and develop technology more um for the, all different parts of hospitality especially in the events industry because right now this, this event last year around this time would have been in person we would have never thought that we could host an entire event online like this um so yeah you'll see that a lot in the hospitality industry right now if technology is something that interests you there's so many new technology that's been developed very recently so moving on to dr barber so dr barber is a lawyer speaker consultant educator author and provides litigation support to hospitality companies nationwide she is also a gsu faculty member i took her class last semester um, <laughs> working with the dean's office in the robinson college of business She's a recipient of the 2013 Anthony G. Marshall Hospitality Law Award, a national award given for her pioneering contributions to hospitality law. Diana serves as of counsel with Berman Fink Van Horn. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Barber. Um, we are so excited to talk to you about hospitality law. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Of course. So I'll kick off the question and answer with some of my questions right here. And after I ask you a few questions, I'll open it up to the floor for everyone else to ask you some questions as well, if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. So first off, um, broadly, what is hospitality law? What are a few day-to-day -day tasks that your position at Lodge Law consists of? Great, great questions that you sent me. I think that um, the best way to describe what hospitality law is, is all the laws, the ordinances, the statutes, case law, codes of conduct, anything that deals with the business of hospitality, whether it be food and beverage, the items that you included at, on your initial slide there, food and beverage, lodging, travel, transportation, events, um, all those kind of things. It's anything that deals with those in, con in connection with the relationship with the clients, the employees, the vendors, the owners. So it's all encompassing. It's really what guides the business to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Yeah. Now, I, lately what I've been doing, um, I've been doing more event issues because, because of COVID. Uh, weddings, for example, have been a big issue because of the restrictions and all of the CDC guidelines, because it's such a new topic. There's not been any litigation, so we don't have a whole lot of to go on. What we have is the CDC guidelines, the health department guidelines. And so that's kind of been the focus on what, how do we, how do we open restaurants and how do we have events and how do we do all this stuff? And what if we don't, you know, what if a local, let's say a, a city or a county says you have to have masks and you don't have those, you know, what are the consequences of that? So it's been a big topic with weddings lately, as I'm sure you can imagine. The industry is still locked down in a lot of ways, the meeting and events. Uh, people are doing more things online, like you mentioned earlier, that there's this technology that we have now. But really the uh, things that I'm doing today, these days is helping wedding planners get through various issues because people have had to cancel their weddings or scale down their weddings and they've put up deposits or they've paid for services and there's been disputes about, you know, what do I get back? And it, I've been trying to hold a lot of hands through some of these issues because we don't have any set litigation or, um, case law. We have some statutes out there already about liability with businesses. If you walk into a business, um, then you've waived your right to sue them for COVID related things. Um, that's in Georgia. I don't know about other states, but really I've been trying to help meeting planners get through some of these, these difficult times. Um, yeah. But what I do on a daily basis or when I really was more focused on practicing hospitality law is so huge. It's so long. Um, I'm really helping them with the pros and cons of trying to deal with whatever issues come about regarding the hospitality industry. But I've had to scale back my practice, as you know, Maddie, because I have this uh, business value in you, which is a required course for business majors and hospitality majors. 
Uh, and that's taken up a lot of my time. I had 800 students at the beginning of the semester. So you can imagine that that is a, that's, a, that's quite a number of students to have to, uh, to monitor. I love that class. I love the, what we're doing. And I think it's a great initiative. But back to law. <laughs> I have done um, everything from construction loans to the development part, the real estate end through the operations part of it reviewing contracts, dealing with um, guest complaints, dealing with various laws that affect the, the hospitality industry, the Americans with Disability Act and the um, just anything, you know, the, the leave laws, the uh, it really, it's just so broad. And if you've taken the human resource course, um, a human um, resource management, you'll see that that impacts a lot of what happens with dealing with employees and such. But um, I've dealt with extended stay guests, guests who don't want to leave, you know, evictions, um, Airbnb issues that um, pop up from time to time, human trafficking, all those kind of things are all, all encompassing. So uh, it was really a, a, a great field to be in because you do see a little bit of everything. So I enjoyed exactly. that very much. Yeah, that was interesting what you said about during COVID-19, um, dealing with event planners who people had to cancel their events and how do you deal with that like deposit that came back like who gets that money all of that stuff my sister-in-law she's a wedding videographer so uh -huh. she had a lot of that happen and people have to pay like a deposit when they hire her uh -huh. and there were some people that got really angry when they couldn't get their deposit back but they signed a contract that said you know that money was yeah so and the problem with the contracts is and anyone who's taken my my hospitality law class that i taught for many many years you know, there's a provision in there that excuses performance if it's impossible to hold the function. Like at 9-11, there was a Marriott that was right at ground zero that was demolished. You couldn't have the function mm -hmm. because the building no longer existed. Well, this pandemic hit us, you know, at a time where we weren't thinking about changing the verbiage and the contracts to include pandemics or epidemics or any of those kind of things. So most contracts that were signed before last January, a year ago, they're silent about that. So that's that's tough. It's tough to negotiate when something hits you, you know, from left field like that. Yeah, it's it's crazy how everything changed so quickly. Everything changed. Yep. yep. Um, my next question is, what has your career journey been like? Have you practiced hospitality law for most of your post college career or did you do something else? Yeah, I'll tell you, my path is a, is a very interesting one, and I do not recommend anybody to take my particular path because I actually stumbled into it. I'm delighted that I stumbled into it, but I could have stumbled a different way. Um, I went to University of South Florida in Tampa. I grew up in Miami, and I majored in criminal justice, so you would never expect a criminal justice person to go into hospitality, ultimately. Um, but after I got my degree is when uh, at USF, I decided, well, I did want to go to law school because I wanted to be a special agent for the FBI. Um, for various reasons, I didn't go that path. I, I decided to go on to law school and I went to law school at um, Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. I did well. There weren't a lot of distractions in Macon, Georgia at the time. So I did very well. I studied hard. I got on law review, which I highly recommend because it opens up a lot of doors for you. Um, law review is usually the top 10% of the class. So after that, I got a really good job downtown Atlanta with one of the major firms downtown, King and Spalding. I was there for about three years doing, I started out in litigation. Um, and then I actually worked with Sally Yates. I worked with her. She was at King and Spalding when I was there. Uh, her husband actually held my hand through my first deposition. So that was kind of a you know, I got to throw her name around when I can because she's an important person. But anyway, so I was at King and S, King and Spalding for about three years. And then I found out that Ritz Carlton was forming a legal department. Now, at that time, they were across from Lenox Square in Buckhead. Uh, King and Spalding was doing some legal work for Ritz Carlton, but I had never done any of that. But I had done quite a few construction loans. I did the, uh, the construction loans, the development loans for the Ritz Carlton and Amelia Island and Marina Del Rey in California. So I was doing a lot of that. And my job at, at uh, Ritz Carlton, uh, excuse me, at King and Spalding was a three year job, but because um, I was only there three years, but the job at, at Ritz Carlton was supposed to be a two year job. It was supposed to be just to help them get these construction loans going and build more hotels. And when I started, um, 
at, at uh, Ritz Carlton, they had seven, seven lawyers in five hotels. Uh, at the and my two year job ended up being a 14 year job. I uh, when I left there, I we had one lawyer and 60 hotels, so it kind of changed a lot over the years. But I had the fortunate pleasure um, in 1990, uh, 19, it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> it was 1991. I had the pleasure of opening. The Ritz Carlton in San Francisco. Now I'd never been to a hotel opening before. They don't usually ask lawyers to go there, but everybody was coming back from these hotel openings like they were like high or something because they were also ex excited about it. And they, it's like a 10 day countdown opening for a hotel. If anybody's not open a hotel, that's quite an experience. Um, they don't sleep uh, for like 10 days. They're getting the hotel ready to go. And everybody was coming back in the corporate office with all these great stories. And I said, well, I need to check this out. So I talked my way onto the opening team and I went out there and I had the best time. Uh, the best time, uh, I, they put me in valet parking to train the valet parkers because I thought there was a lot of liability there. So um, I had the best time. The people in hospitality and, and hotels was just, just, just totally captured me. I really embraced it. So I started doing more operations work, which got me talking to controllers and PR people and sales and marketing people and general managers. And I mean, I just had the best job ever. And it was an in-house position. So I'd worked in private practice, which was fine. But when you're in private practice as a lawyer, you're basically cleaning up a mess. When you're in-house attorney, you're, you're, you can anticipate where things are going the wrong way and you can fix them before they become a mess. Mm. And it's hard to document the value to that I always add several zeros to whatever my value is, but this was a, um, a chance to really make a difference and to create policy. At that time, Ritz Carlton was a um, private company. It was before Marriott purchased them. So we were smaller and uh, I did most of my best lawyering on the way to the ladies room. That's where I did most of my policy making, believe it or not. But it was a, it was a path that I was so grateful to have because being an in-house counsel to me is, is the best. Now you work, you work, um, you don't work the same kind of hours as you would in private practice because there you work around the clock. So you had reasonable hours. You don't make as much money as you would in private practice, but you still make pretty darn good. Plus the perks are pretty nice when you when you work for a hotel company. So it was really a, a wonderful, wonderful job to have uh, a career. It was uh, probably the best place of, you know, to, to work, to practice law. When Marriott bought the company, I didn't want to move up to Maryland, which is where the corporate office is based. So I ended up in, I'll tell you, this is important for networking purposes. I went and had a conversation with the prior COO, the chief operating officer of Ritz Carlton, Mr. Hor Schultze. And I, I mentioned to him that I wasn't going to move up to where Marriott is and I wanted to teach. I thought teaching would be a really, uh, I could share some knowledge with them. And he put me in touch with Dr. Cannon and the rest is just history. I started teaching there as an adjunct professor, loved it. Absolutely loved it. I had done presentations for general managers and controllers and uh, rooms division people and food and beverage people. I've done a lot of conferences, but teaching students was, was so exciting for me. And eventually a permanent position was created. And so I've been teaching since, I don't know, 20 or 2004, I don't even know, long time ago, but I loved it. So I don't, I don't really recommend this career path because I, as I said, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, but let me do share, I don't know if this is one of your later questions about, well, I'll let you, I think we are going to get to that if we have time. Um, but I would, I would take a different path today, but it is just, it was so much fun and I, and I don't have any, any regrets at all and it, everything's just worked out just perfectly. Well, that's awesome. And we are so lucky to have you here. So I'm glad Thank you stumbled you. upon door. Actually, I'll pause on my questions and give us time so other people can ask you questions. So I want to ah. make sure their questions are answered. And if no one has questions, then I'll resume mine. Okay. Okay. But, um, Chow Yin, if you know or call upon the people who have questions. If you have questions and you want to just unmute yourself, that's fine too. But if there were questions that came through during the presentation, I'd love to answer those. I had a quick question for Dr. Barber. Sure. So Dr. Barber, 
I am currently a international relations and political science major because I'm interested in law school. Although when I go to law school, of course, you know how diverse law is. You can go mm-hmm. to immigration law, hospitality, so many different types of law, but I'm very interested in hospitality. Do you have any advice for someone like me, what I should be doing to prepare for that? Ah, good question. Um, Let me just share with you that my experience, I believe, as far as majors go in undergraduate, an English or business degree is by far the best to prepare yourself for law school. Now, law school is, uh, I don't know if you have applied yet or if you've done any of those things, but um, law school is very broad. They do teach you a lot of different things, but all those things you can apply to hospitality. That's what I love about this this industry is because you can do everything with it. Now, here's some advice that I have for you. If you're thinking of going to law school, get this book. I don't know if this is backward or not. It's called 1L by Scott Turow. All right. This book is what uh, it's written by Scott Turow. It's his accounting of the first year of law school at Harvard University, which would be the worst experience um, or the best. But but the worst case scenario, this is a, I remember when I read this and you can get this like on Amazon for a couple of dollars because it's paperback and uh, you can get it used. Highly recommend that you read this because if you want to go to law school, this will tell you the worst case scenario. Mercer wasn't this bad. In this book, they talk about people, uh, you have to go to the library to get certain answers. Uh, And nowadays people, my my 21 year old goes, what's a library? You know, that kind of stuff. So he doesn't go to the library, but the, um, what you want to do is, Read this and you'll see that back in the day they used to squirrel books. In other words, they'd hide books so other students couldn't get it. Very competitive. My experience wasn't like that. But law school's tough. You usually don't, it's best not to work your first nine months because the first nine months of law school is probably the worst because you're trying to get focused. You're trying to learn the professors. You're trying to learn the material. It's, you need total concentration for that. After that first nine months, it's much easier. I worked my second and third years in law school. Um, but it's tough. You have to learn. You have to really concentrate. I I never really studied a whole lot and I shouldn't be saying this publicly, but I never really studied a whole lot in high school or college, but law school, that's, that took some focus. I did well, got on law review, as I mentioned. So that was a real, a real plus. Um, once you get out of law school to get into the field of hospitality, this is what I advise students to do rather than fall into it the way I did. Go into private practice with a firm that has a department within the law firm, the private law firm, that has clients that are hospitality clients. Go to work, all all the major brands, hotels, restaurants, whatever, they all have out, they all have lawyers, they may have in-house lawyers, which is the, the dream job, but they all have outside counsel and usually worldwide because they have to, um, Uh, there's sometimes you can't do things in house. You have to do things locally. So go into a law firm and practice law within a firm that has a department in hospitality. And there's many of them that do this. Start working and learning the hospitality business from the legal side. And then get have your relationships with your clients that are very close. So when a position does open up for an in-house position, they'll think of you immediately. And then that's when you make the shift. That's what I would recommend. And then if you want to down the road, go into education like I have is basically I've had two careers, the legal career and the education, but I'm still doing some of the legal stuff here and there. Um, You can make those decisions down the road. But if you want to go practice international law, having an international background is is very important too. Uh, But it's all about networking. It's all who you know and how you get into it. But I really recommend getting some practice. If you want to go in-house with the company that does uh, like Yum Brands or somebody else that does, um, or even a major hotel company, IHG or Marriott, you want to have some private practice experience first. Uh, That's what they're looking for. Some lawyers get out, some people get out of law school and they go to clerk for a judge. That's another way to kind of get into the into that realm. But I highly recommend getting some industry practice as, as a private practitioner but get to know the hospitality clients because that's when those jobs are going to open up and you're going to be a perfect fit for it. So if I had to do it all over again, that's the way I would do it. Perfect. Thank you so much for all your insight. Oh, certainly, certainly. 
All right. Um, I think we have time just to be respectful for Dr. Barber's time. I think we have time for one more question. Um, if someone else has another question to ask, um, we are running low on time, but yeah, you can go ahead and ask your question if you have another one. One of the things, Maddie, that you asked me about was um, a particular time in my in my um, career uh, where I had a, uh, a good experience or a good case that I worked on. Yes, Do you want me to yes. share that? I mean, I have so many stories, but I know I, we don't have time for that. And I'm going to write a book. Story, so I would like to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> one day, I keep threatening I'm going to write a book one day, but I haven't done that yet. But let me share with you one one really pretty cool um, case that I worked on that was pretty exciting for me because I felt like I really had done a, a real service for my client. Um, there was a, a piece of business that was booked at a Ritz Carlton Hotel. I don't even remember which one, but it was a huge $350,000 piece of business by a pharmaceutical company. Well, this pharmaceutical company, a uh, huge company, did work, did, um, did the contract with the sales and marketing department by using a travel agent or planning agent or something like that. This travel agent was the one negotiating with the contract. It was for food and beverage and guest rooms and such. The, um, the event was a huge success. Everybody really had a great time. Everything was perfect. Well, when uh, the event was over, the, the, um, the client of the company, this pharmaceutical company, paid the travel agent who was supposed to forward it on to Ritz-Carlton, but never did. $350,000. Wow. He took the money and paid off other debts, or he just went to, I don't know, Canada or wherever he went. Who knows? So I put, I got on the phone with the client, the pharmaceutical company, and I said, you know, I talked to their lawyers and I said, you know, we never got the money. You paid them. They took off with it. And you're the one who brought this travel agent to us. We don't know. We don't have a relationship with this person. We trusted that you had the relationship. And they were saying, no, no, you have to go after the travel agent. I said, we don't even know where he is. How are we going to go after him? So we were planning on gearing up to file a lawsuit and then almost like magic, a check for $350,000 came into the mail, not addressed to me or I'd probably be gone by now, but um, but addressed to Ritz Carlton, the hotel where they had it. And so when I spoke with the attorney, I said, what what happened? Did you find the guy? And he, they said, no, but, and this is where it's so important because timing's always always right. That That pharmaceutical company was going through some sort of merger. And it was really important that they not let this screw up the deal, that they had this potential litigation out there. So they just wrote another check for 350,000. So I went into the president of the company and I said, look what I got. And he was like super thrilled. And I said, I guess I earned my paycheck for the day. And uh, so that was a good thing. It, it ended up well for the hotel because that would have just totally thrown off their budget forever. So it worked really well for them. But anyway, that was just one of the things that I thought of that um, a good time that we had. Um, and not having to litigate because that was the one thing I never wanted to do. You know, one other point I know we're running out of time is when you're an attorney, whether you're a hospitality lawyer or otherwise, one of the things that I've learned is to be a counselor and not just in the sense of law, but in the sense of a therapist. So many times guests would be so upset about something and whatever it might be, and they'd scream and yell at the hotel staff or the, or the food and beverage manager or whoever. And then I'd get them on the phone because when they can't deal with the hotel, they'd call the corporate office. And so those calls always came to me. I would just listen to them and let them air whatever it was that was bothering them. And most of the time, they just went away without having to you know, pay them off or do anything like that. So being a good lawyer to me is also being a good listener. Wow, I never, I never thought about that, but that's really interesting. And thank you so much for sharing that story as well. If students have questions for you, um, are you available to answer their questions over email? Absolutely. Um, can I share their e your email with them? Yeah, absolutely. dsbarber at gsu.edu. So I'm more than happy to, to help mentor students. And, and I just wish you all the best of luck. I mean, I think law school is, it will never, it'll never hold you back. It'll never be a, you'll never regret it, I don't think. Even if you never practice law. I went to law school with numerous people, never practiced law but there's very successful in other areas of business. I think we have one person raised their hand. I think oh. that's Julia, do you still have questions? Feel free to speak up. Yeah, I just had one question um, for Dr. Barber. Um, I'm actually in your class this semester or your business class. I'm really enjoying it. 
Um, Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested in hospitality event coordinating specifically. Um, and I've got a little bit of, you know, casual experience with it. Um, and I've talked to a lot of people that have the job just trying to learn from them. And a lot of them have told me um, that getting a hospitality degree specifically is helpful, but it's not like necessary um, or required when getting a position at a corporation. They more are interested in seeing that you have experience and good references and things like that. Um, and so what I'm what I'm planning for, at least what my hopes are for my future is to get to the point where I'm doing freelance work. Um, and that might mean having some people working underneath me or working on my own, just doing smaller things like weddings or just small events. Um, and so my question was, do you think it would be most beneficial if I took the pathway of hospitality for that, you know, um, future goal, or if you think more of like management or entrepreneurship would be a better route? And, you know, that's a good question, Julia. And what I would, what I would focus on is, do you want to own your own hotel? Do you want to own your own restaurant? There's a lot of things in entrepreneurship that will help you. So that might be a double major kind of consideration. Hospitality, the courses that you're going to take for that major is going to cover everything. You know, you're going to get the marketing. You're going to get specifically hospitality marketing. Marketing. You're going to get hospitality finance. You're going to get those things, HR, things that are specific to hospitality. You can't go wrong with a hospitality degree because it's a business degree. Okay. So it, and I've seen people get, be successful without them. But I think if you come up against somebody for that same position, but you have a hospitality degree, I think you're going to shine more than you would if you just had a, a management degree or a finance degree. I think you, you add more to the conversation and more to the potential um, job. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a great role to have. Um, maybe it's undersold somewhat, but I think you, you, uh, again, it's super competitive out there and you're going to need that. And if you're looking to stay in the hospitality industry, you're going to have a leg up and those people that don't have that experience and that education, they're going to feel less than, um, when it comes to the business world with hospitality. So stick with it. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And thank you for the kind words about BUSA 1105. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I just want to chime in that, you know, if you are unsure if you want to add hospitality at a double major or a minor, mm -hmm. our course are open to all major as long as you have the minimum requirement of the GPA. So mm -hmm. take one of our class to see how you like it. You know, if you take hospitality law, you're going to study from the book that Dr. Barber Ooh no! Um, so you will <laughs> learn from from that book and then uh, see all the inside, all the example, all the you know terminology about hospitality law. Uh, but if you have any questions um, about taking the class or just minoring or double majoring, I would suggest you reach out to us um, and we can kind of meet one on one to discuss further how we can help you select the best class so that you can kind of test it out. Uh, and even if you should want to have a one on one conversation and to kind of see, okay, let me take this class and see what opportunity are out there within the industry so that uh, we can help you. That would be a, a, a good way to get you started as well. Terrific. Yeah. Great advice. But um, I did want to, my name is Chow. I'm sorry, I don't know if I <laughs> used myself at the beginning, but I enjoy hearing from Dr. Barber and the presentation so much. I feel like I was attending, not really is hosting or anything. <laughs> um, I am the business manager for the School of Hospitality. Um, I'm also an alum from the hospitality program, alum from Georgia State. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't take Dr. Barber class, but I wish I did. Um, you know, um, we are so thankful to have Dr. Barber here today. And like she said, if you have any questions, reach out to us. She's welcome to answer any of your questions too. Uh, but on behalf of school, Dr. Barber, we are thankful to have you. Thank you so much for your time today, uh, speaking and sharing knowledge with all of our students. I'm sure they all enjoyed it just like I did. Um, and we look forward to many more events in the future with you if we can. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. And I, I wish you all a wonderful, wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Yeah, and I think Maddie, you have the last slide just so that yes. everyone can kind of screenshot. If you want to reach out to us, 
uh, via phone. We have our email here. This is the, the last one is our website. Um, has a lot of information, so it can be overwhelming. If you come across something from the website and you are unsure <laughs> to have more questions, definitely reach out to us. We love to speak to people and talk to people and make sure that you understand everything before you make your decision of, you know, doing this as your career or majoring in. So, yeah. Thank you all so yeah. much for attending today. This was so much fun. I hope you learned a lot. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me personally also and Yin. Yin, if you want to drop your email in the chat, I can see if I can. Yeah, let me drop mine really quick. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. Have a great week. Bye-bye now.